Good morning, everyone. Sabah uh, al Thank you, Rod, for that kind uh, introduction. I thought uh, we'd start today by reminding ourselves that we are, the idea is to have a scientific lecture and what science really is. So I've got a clip for you from, by Richard Feynman. He was a physicist uh, in America and in 1965 won the Nobel Prize for Science. And I think he does a really great job of summarizing a scientific method. So let's... Uh now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we... Com well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compare to experiment or experience. Compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. So isn't that a great summary of science? And it all really starts with a guess, but I'll get back to that a little bit later. So we're going to talk about things that I uh, like to call research in real life. And uh, just before I start, I have no disclosures if you're going to use this for CME points. Uh, I am originally from South Africa, as Rod said, so don't hold that against me. Uh, but I want to particularly emphasize that I have no affiliation with Leicester City. And I think the ad that the marketing guys put together kind of give, gave that away. So we're going to use uh, their story a little bit this morning. And I think we were all just really captured by what happened at this club this season, going from relegation to winning arguably the toughest football league in the world. Now, of course, after something like this, a lot of people have opinions and reasons why that happened. And uh, Alistair McGowan, a journalist for BBC Sport, wrote a really great piece on the science behind their win. I know many of you know this now and have read it. Uh, a couple of you tweeted it. I know Dermot Simpson and Johnny King and George Nassis had it on his LinkedIn profile. So I know it's out there. But I think it really created a wonderful template for us to talk about the, the science that Leicester employed in their season and how that gave them some success. Uh, and it really is based on a podcast, historic performance podcast that they did with Matt Reeves, their fitness guy. And as a physio, I had to show Dave Rennie, who's the, the physio at the club. Now, this is how we'll shape the talk. Um, they are, this, these are the main components from the, the article that comes out really strongly. Now, I don't know anything about beetroot shots or um, ice chamber research, so we'll leave those. And we'll talk about uh, these three components. And I'll start with uh, load management. So that's from Tim Gabbett's article that he wrote for BJSM. That's a really great summary of how we interpret load management. And I'm sure many of you know the sports science members or colleagues in the audience will tell us that this is kind of the flavor of the month. Uh, everybody is talking about loading and how to measure load. And Tim's um, open access articles, you can go download it, uh, kind of approaches that uh, in his view of how we look at workload and, and management. And then he did a great podcast as well on how the medical team and the performance team can work together to really use that information to treat the athletes. So this is the, the graph from, from Tim's article, and it explains uh, uh, really the likelihood of having an injury here on the, on the y-axis to the acute chronic workload ratio on the x-axis. Now, in this uh, sense, acute means the exercises that induces fatigue, so the high intensity, perhaps more high intensity stuff that you do, and then chronic refers to fitness or endurance of the athlete, and the relationship between those two factors. So Tim developed these two zones. He called the one the sweet spot. That's where we propose you have a decreased injury risk, so you don't really have such a high injury risk, and as you move in here, uh, you get an increased injury risk. So that puts you on the highway to the danger zone. Highway to the danger zone. 
I don't know how many of you are Top Gun fans, but I can't not think of that when uh, I see this graph. So what you really want to do is stay in the sweet spot. You want to avoid the danger zone where you've got a poor balance between your acute and your chronic workload. And I think that's what Leicester City did. Now, if we think about hamstrings, we know hamstring injuries happen when we run at high speed. So what does this mean? How do we interpret this? Does it mean we do less high-speed running to improve the acute chronic workload? I don't think it does. This is a graph from a work done by Stephen Duhigg, a young Australian researcher. And he shows um, basically that your probability of a hamstring injury again increases if the amount of spikes in your high-speed running uh, goes up. So spiking in high-speed running volumes is associated with a hamstring injury. And I think Lester did a great job by avoiding this, not by doing less, but indeed by doing more high-speed running. So on a Thursday at the end of their training session, everybody's tired, they let everybody line up and do a 40-meter sprint. And that's a good example where they've taken this training load principle and they've applied this research in real life. So the main part of my talk then will, will, uh, will be focused on hamstring strength. So when I say we have to talk about hamstring strength, I know there's some of guys in the audience that will say, are you sure you want to do that? Uh, and that's a, a, a little bit of an adaptation from a tweet Matt did when he was in Norway recently. And most of you will say, oh, I've heard this all before. So th the question is why? why? Why then do we have to talk again about hamstring strength? The reason is that hamstring injuries is still the number one injury in football. And if you have a squad of 25 players, you can expect six of them, more or less, to have a hamstring injury. That's about 37% of all the injuries we see. So it's still a, a something we have to deal with. The UEFA study group under the leadership of Jan Ekstrand has shown us that in the past 13 years, we've actually seen an annual increase of about 4% in the hamstring injuries. So it seems like we're not doing a good job at getting the injuries to come down. Uh, there might be reasons for that that we can explore. And why is this important? Why do we need to, to curb the hamstring injuries? If we're managing them well, that's okay, right? Well, if we think first of the financial implication, and you can do the math here with me, uh, if a, this is also modified from a slide from Jan, if, you, if you've got a player in a frontline player, they pay him about 20,000 euros a day. So if you work out how many players miss a season and how many days that is, that's about 22 million euros. So if we think about that a different way, you could have 110 doctors looking after your team, right? So you're missing out on a lot of medical coverage, but clearly that's a big financial implication. And if your injury list looks like this, you're obviously not a happy coach. And I've highlighted the hamstring injuries there. There's about 20 of them. So this is from a website, physioroom.com. It's really great. And you can see that that's an extensive injury list for this season and way too many hamstring injuries. On the other hand, if your injury list looks like this, you're probably pretty happy. I mean, you've also won the league, so you're definitely happy, but uh, you've only had five hamstring injuries. So that's really what we want. And at Leicester, it was clear that they found a winning formula to reduce the number of injuries. They also used the fewest number of players, and, and they still had better performance, right? The, the fastest players and the most shots on goal. So, it seems like if the success they had in some way was correlated to them being able to prevent the injuries. Now, if we talk about injury prevention, we've got to go back to 1992 and Willem von Mechelen's model with these four steps. Roald Barr did an excellent job at the recent uh, GCC medical conference of, of explaining that really well. So I'm not going to do the more formal one. We'll do the more informal one. And this is really what we mean when we talk about Willem's model. We, de we determine the magnitude of the problem. We try and understand the causes of that. Why do we have these injuries? We form some sort of idea for prevention. And then we go and test it and see if we've changed the, the problem. So I've shown you now the magnitude. And I think it's clear that it's still the number one injury. Do we then have any idea for the causes behind these injuries? There are many. And in the research, you'll find a lot of different proposed risk factors for hamstring injuries. And uh, we all have uh, seen or some of these papers, and you probably have your favorite one on that list. But in 2013, Tanya Pizzari and Grant Frickleton did a systematic review, 
and this one I think really does add value, and looked at all these different risk factors, and they, just, they saw that these were the ones that were associated with a hamstring injury when we pull all the data together. Now, there's some things we can do something about <coughs> and some things we can't, and getting older is certainly something we can't. So previous injury as well, I'll remove the non-modifiable risk factors, and then we're left with quadriceps strength, hamstring strength, I, eccentric strength I put in. It didn't really get in, but I think it's close enough to consider it, and we have so much data on that. So at Aspitar, the, the, let me say, the problem with these risk factor studies is that it's often small sample sizes and not many injuries. So at the end of these articles, we always read there's no more research that needs to be done. So we wanted to finally answer that question. Can strength be identified as a risk factor for a hamstring injury? Before I show you what we did here at Aspitar, we all know what a unique environment we're in. And this is really to acknowledge that there are many collaborators when such a project uh, is done. Uh, there are many more, um, uh, but it shows you how many people gets involved. And I'd be a bad student if I didn't emphasize my uh, two research supervisors. So they really brought it all together. But that's the front line. Behind that, uh, and under the great leadership of Dr. Rashid and Pierre, the, the, the real work that happens, happens out on the field. And without that, it simply wouldn't work, right? So this is an older picture I know, but it should give you some impression of what really goes into a study like this. And, and you'll excuse me if I just emphasize these three guys, Dennis, Ivan, and Tony, who year after year volunteer their free time to come and help us do the screening. And without them and their, their assistance, it really wouldn't be possible. So they really make it all happen. But everybody involved, is they're, they're, that's really how something like this comes off the ground. And this is what we did. So we looked at all the teams that plays in the QSL. And as part of their periodic health evaluation, they, their screening, they come in and we do an isokinetic test. And then on the right, you can see our isokinetic protocol. So both the hamstrings and the quadriceps are tested concentrically at low and high speed. And then the hamstrings are tested eccentrically at uh, low speed. And then we were able to collect data on 190 injuries. So I've done this presentation or this part before, but just to make that sink in again, that's four seasons. Over 600 subjects, we did almost 2,000 isokinetic tests and 190 injuries. So being able to do this gave us a lot of power in our questioning. And we were really able to look at all the possible strength measurements we could think of. Now, if you've heard Roald Barr talk about presentation, he'll say the first rule is never, ever use a table in your presentation. So I'd like to show you this table. <laughs> and I've highlighted the two factors that were significant in our findings. Indeed, exactly like we found with the systematic review, quadriceps strength, uh, quadriceps strength and hamstring strength, uh, eccentric strength, normalized to body weights were significant. But the reason I like the table is it shows you that we've actually included 14 different things there. Absolute value, body weight value, or normalized to body weight, and the HQ ratios. And only two got in. And that's really not the full picture. So to satisfy Rod and many of us now, I'll have to show that to you in a different way. So now you see the effect size instead of the p-values and the absolute difference between the injured and the uninjured group. If you're not familiar with isokinetic testing, seven Newton meters on this test is within the normal variation. That's not enough to clinically distinguish between the individuals who will get injured and those who won't. So that doesn't help us in that sense. But that doesn't mean it's not part of the cause of the injury. Be having such a strong study, we were able to really look for small associations. And that's our conclusion in the end. We should really call these small associations weak risk factors. So although we cannot identify individuals, this test have, doesn't have good properties to do that, we do know that strength seems to be part of why we get a hamstring injury. And we were pretty honest about that when we published this paper, in, and luckily AJSM still accepted it. So now I've shown you that we probably have a good idea about strength being part of the cause. Do we then have an idea for prevention? And I think we do, and I'm sure you're all well familiar with it. 
the Nordic hamstring exercise. Now, I know that it has a host of different names and with such a variety in the audience, I'm sure we all call it something different. But since we have so many Norwegians working with us here at Aspital, we'll call it the Nordic hamstring exercise. Marco Cardinale posted this picture on the left last year, and I think it's absolutely great. It's a book by a guy called Gio Taylor, uh, Health by Exercise. So exercise as medicine has been around for a while. And it's from, from 1880. And then on the right, I've put up the, the diagram from Jesper Peterson's article in 2011 that really popularized and brought the exercise back to life as a prevention me measure. So as so often uh, with uh, what we see, it only took science about 130 years to catch up and to show us that what we think is valuable actually is valuable. Now, I'm sure you've all had exposure to this in the past, and here at Aspital, we've had uh, different trainings with it. This is Jose doing one, I think we were doing an a FIFA 11 plus training course here. Either Abdallah is really strong or he's not really holding Jose down, but I think he's also been dethroned now by some new members of the rehab staff in strength. But this exercise has become really popular and it's part of a lot of prevention programs. And the guys who really uh, did a lot of work into this is from Australia. Their, their hamstring group under the leadership of uh, particularly Tony Shield and David Opar. And they developed, they wanted to know how do we put a, a, a value on this exercise? How do we make it measurable? So they developed a device to measure the force you produce during the, the Nordic uh, hamstring exercise. And uh, it's now actually been taken up by another company and it's commercially available. And we have one here at Aspital. So at the end of the presentation, we'll do a quick uh, demonstration. But this, what this uh, Nord board really does is give us a way of quantifying this. So it's the same exercise. It's two load cells that measures the force. And you can see in, in real time the feedback from, from the exercise. Also the balance between left and right. You can give that back to the player right there um, on the spot and then eventually even do this out on the field. So this device has given us a load of di loads of different uh, application possibilities. And hopefully it can increase the compliance of the exercise. So why? Why are we so convinced that this exercise work works? Well, if we combine the results from the randomized controlled tri trials, uh, you can see that there's a significant reduction in injuries in the group that's doing these Nordic hamstring exercises. In fact, 67.5%. Now, we should really end the discussion there. If you get a 70% reduction in your injuries, everybody should be doing it. It, beca it becomes almost unethical not to do Nordics uh, with your team. But there is still some debate about why this exercise works, right? So we've got this great data to show that it's effective, but in theory, it doesn't seem to make sense if we think about how hamstrings get injured. So the mechanism of a hamstring injury happens at high speed. Uh, it's focused around the hip joint with the knee extended, and the muscle most often injured is the biceps femoris, particularly the long head. The Nordic hamstring exercise is a low speed exercise bilaterally focused around the knee with the hip extended and the muscles that it targets is the other way around, the short head of biceps and the semitendinosus. So it seems like we have this odd choice. If we do the exercise, it works, but the theory doesn't make sense. So we're losing something or we're maybe targeting the wrong muscle. Now, um, Eric and I have developed a great relationship and I'm sure all of you at some, ex at, at some stage have heard Eric uh, make some good quotes. This is Dutch and it says Kiezen is for Liesen and roughly translated that means choosing is losing. So if you have a choice and choose something, you have to most of the time lose something else. So is this the case with the Nordic hamstring exercise? Well, maybe it's not. So this is an article, another open access article in BJSM by another student of Eric's, Joke Scheuermann. And she looked at how biceps femoris and semitendinosus work together. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically she did a scan of both uh, uh, legs, upper thighs or posterior thighs. And after the scan, the, the patients had to do a strenuous bilateral hamstring exercise uh, that they did to the rhythm of a metronome until exhaustion. And then immediately after that, they took uh, an MRI again. They measured the T2 relaxation times of each scan and the difference between the T2 value at rest and the T2 value after the exercise is called the T2 shift. 
Now this indicates how active the muscle has been, the metabolic activity of the different muscle groups. So if I show you the results, and this is first only the control group, you can see that it forms this really asymmetrical pattern with the semitendinosus in the middle being the most active. And this is also true for the injured group. But here you can see how much harder the biceps femoris uh, muscle is working. Um, although the semitendinosus is still more active, it's dropped its strength. So I know that's kind of hard to conceptualize from that graph. So I'll show it to you in a different way. Let's take a typical hamstring muscle and we'll split it up into the three different muscle groups. So semimembranosis on the far left, semitendinosis and biceps femoris. Now these two, semitendinosis and biceps femoris, are responsible for 80% of the metabolic activity. So 80% of the activity is produced here. Why are they coupled? Maybe because they share a common tendon, but they certainly work together. So after a hamstring injury, what Yorka showed is, and she's also actually now done this prospectively, your semitendinosus muscle decreases in activity and the, uh, the biceps femoris increases in activity, which forms a much more symmetrical pattern. Now I'll get rid of semimembranosus because it's not part of our conversation, but if we think about the terminal end of the swing phase in running, where we know most hamstring, hamstring injuries happen, we know that there's a maximal eccentric activation Biceps femoris gets elongated and activated, but the main worker here is still semitendinosus. So in an injury, when, when the semitendinosus drops and the biceps femoris has to work harder, there's a, an increased load on biceps femoris that it's not accustomed to, it's not made for, and we're kind of setting it up to fail. So if we get back to uh, our choice, we have to decide whether we treat the victim, the biceps femoris, or do we also want to treat the cause? And it's clear that we should also focus on the semitendinosis when we do uh, training for these muscles, uh, both in rehab and in prevention, and that is exactly what the Nordic hamstring uh, exercise do, does. Another uh, uh, reason why we think they're not so popular or why, they, why the Nordic hamstring exercise and all this data we have have not dropped the injuries is perhaps compliance. So Ruald, Christian, and Jan showed that top-level teams simply don't do their Nordics. And why not? There, there might be different reasons for it. I think if you follow Jesper Peterson's uh, um, proposed uh, training load, uh, after week 10, you're doing one set a week. So four minutes a week to reduce 70% of your hamstring injuries, I think that's an easy decision. And if you don't believe me, ask Dr. Shebi. He's actually seen the same results in his team when they've, when they've implemented the Nordics. And teams that have done that, that have practiced this research in real life have had some success and have uh, had very little hamstring injuries. So the only thing left to talk about then is shared decision making. Now I don't know if there's that much research available on shared decision making but we do s intuitively know that if the communication between different members of the, the management team is good that the team benefits from that. So is uh, Jimmy Vardy thinking of his evening party, hopefully not. When the coach says that, he's, he's got the message and he knows what he has to do and there's a clear cohesion between the different members of the team. We know that doesn't always happen. A good uh, example at Leicester is that they've actually practiced what they preach, right? So they, they really got the, everybody involved and when Claudio Ranieri took over, uh, they didn't change the backroom staff. The, the, the team mainly stayed the same, the an analytic team stayed the same, so they really had a great cohesion between these and then he allowed them to be part of the decision making. Paul Dijkstra proposed such a model in 2014, this is also published in the Aspetar Journal, an integrated performance health management and coaching model. I'm not going to get into detail, the, the real purpose of showing this is that there's so much overlap between the different departments between the medical team, between the performance team, the coaching team, the sports science team. Everybody has to get involved. I haven't even talked about uh, Lester and their psychologist, uh, I think it's uh, Ken Wei or something, but th they all really became part of this team. And I'd like to propose that here at Aspetar, we've got exactly that, don't we? And we are again faced with the choice to really integrate this model to provide really excellent care for our athletes. We've got the opportunity to do it, that's for sure. 
Right, so what I didn't talk about are these two things, because I'm not sure if that's true. Hopefully they decided to do that after Dan King stopped consulting at Leicester. But uh, there might be something to that, right? Because they've used it in this winning season. This was part of their plan. Cryotherapy has had a lot of research that hasn't been positive, but there's some, something might be there. And we're in such a good position to answer some of those questions. So I think if we go back to the incredible Mr. Feynman, science really does start with a guess. Uh, we compute the consequences, we think of the possible outcomes, and then we do an experiment. And I'd like to uh, mention that uh, now, and I think this is really the, the, the truth. You, everyone in this room that works with players on the field, you are in the best position to make that guess. That is where the really good questions come from. And we're in this environment where you can have that conversation with great researchers and scientists to explore that guess and to determine whether we really have answers. In that way, I think we'll be practicing research in real life. So if you're into injury prevention, the world championship of that is in Monaco next year and they've got a great lineup. So I invite you all to go there. Thank you very much for your attention.